Well, hello again, everybody. Now, for those of you that tuned in to see the second part of our CompuCorp calculator repair, well, I'm sorry, we're not going to be doing that today. But don't worry, the calculator's fine. It's actually gone to live on a farm and it's very happy. But I'm sure we'll see it at some point in the future. Or possibly not. So instead we're going to be doing an unboxing video. Now the main reason we're going to be doing an unboxing video is not because I'm particularly interested in the contents of this box, as probably you won't be either. But unfortunately my wife has been tripping over this box now for the last several months and uh, she's basically said that um, if I don't remove the box she'll remove my conjugals. Head shears offer a two-handle design and long blades that cut all the way to the tip. Perfect for sculpting hedges or ornamental bushes. So what we've got in our box here is a vacuum chamber, and a vacuum pump. Well I'm sure that some of you are wondering why I went ahead and I bought this vacuum chamber and this vacuum pump. Well you're actually quite right to be wondering as well because it has been several months since I actually purchased this and uh, the reason that I actually bought it now escapes me but um, yeah, sale of ease such as a lot of my drunken late night eBay purchases. But if I do try and cast my brain back to medieval times I think it was actually something to do with the want or the need to try to encapsulate some transformers. I think what it was, I'd been watching one of the Shangu videos where he'd taken a line output transformer and uh, he'd put it in a vacuum chamber to actually re-impregnate it with wax. Now one of my friends in particular, Simon Spires, was explaining that they do actually use vacuum chambers where he works because amongst the things that they do make, they do various encapsulations and uh, they encapsulate transformers and he was explaining that what they actually do is they use one of these uh, vacuum chambers to actually impregnate the windings on transformers and inductors with, um, with various types of varnishes or sealants. But the other thing that was in my mind is I also remember at school doing various experiments with vacuum pumps and uh, I just think that vacuum pumps are quite interesting things to play with. I've never actually owned one before and this one was relatively cheap. I think it came as a kit with both the vacuum chamber and the pump and uh, it was less than £100 in total and I bought it off Amazon. So I just thought it might be quite interesting to uh, see what comes in this kit and uh, well just see how it works. So I can't really remember what came in this vacuum chamber kit so you've seen the vacuum pump and I think there's some kind of uh, pressure vessel inside here so let's take a look at that. Can you actually still call it a pressure vessel when it's got a vacuum in it? I'm guessing you can, it just means the pressure is on the outside rather than the inside. Okay, so what have we got here? Well, I'm not sure what that is. It looks like it could be some kind of a, a seal or a, I don't know, a fiberglass filter. Not as if you're sure, I'm sure we might have to read the uh, instructions to find out, which we hate doing. We've got some instructions here and some, looks like, uh, some little air filters. I think I might actually bother to uh, read the instructions this time because I don't really know much about vacuums. I've done quite a lot of work with uh, compressed air and machines that use compressed air and compressors and stuff like that, pneumatics in the past, but I've never done anything with vacuums, but I suppose a vacuum is much the same as a compressed air system. So what else have we got? Oh, that's quite sturdy. Right, okay, so we've got quite um, a sturdy lid. This lid is made out of something like Perspex plastic, something like that. I would say that's probably a good half an inch thick. So that's quite substantial. It's got the manufacturer's name on it, which looks like it's, it's that BAC and that's actually etched in or milled into the plastic. I wonder how thick that is. It, it's, it's very heavy, it's very substantial. Okay, that's about 0.5 of an inch or 14 millimeters thick. So yeah, really quite substantial. And on top of the lid, I can also see that we've got this uh, pressure gauge, which of course is a, a vacuum pressure gauge. And uh, interestingly enough, it works backwards. And uh, looking at it, it looks as though it's, uh, it looks as though it's in bar. 
So the actual needle here, it's actually sat on the uh, on the right hand side. So of course most metre needles sit on the left and then when you actually blow something up or whatever it goes round in a clockwise direction where this actually starts at zero, which I'm guessing is zero is, would that be like one atmosphere? And then it goes all the way to minus 30 or minus one. So to me, I think this black scale here, which is INHG, that actually stands for inches of mercury. And I actually think that's quite a strange calibration because uh, I'm used to working in bar or something like pounds per square inch. But for vacuum systems, and in fact vacuum gauges, this inches of mercury is, uh, is quite a common measurement system. It does say inches there, IN, and the HG is, I think, the elementary symbol for mercury so that's why we get INHG. Well back in the 1600s the Italian philosopher and mathematician Torcelli invented what they call the Torcellian barometer and I'm sure some of you will have actually seen these in laboratories or maybe at museums and stuff like that. Well what he actually discovered was that a column of mercury could be supported by the atmosphere. So this is at sea level so if you take a, a tube of mercury which is sealed at one end and actually upturn it in a bath of mercury, what you'll find is the atmospheric pressure pushing down will support around 30 inches of mercury. Well, it's probably uh, just under 30. It's around 29.7 or something in that figure. Now, of course, the, the height that the mercury is supported does change with the air pressure and stuff like that because that is the idea of a barometer. But on average, you'll find that the atmosphere on Earth, with the weight of the air pressing down on the barometer, it will support about minus 29 inches of mercury. Well, certainly that's what these, uh, these gauges are calibrated at. So where it says minus 30 here, that's kind of, I think, a full vacuum, whereas uh, zero here represents atmospheric pressure. So the needle does move in an anti clockwise direction. And mounted directly under the pressure gauge on this little manifold here we've got a couple of taps here. So I'm guessing what these allow you to do is um, one of them will be connected to the vacuum pump so when you pull the uh, vacuum you want to open one of the taps. Not sure which way it is open but Okay, so when it's in line, when the handle's in line, that's the open position, that's the closed position. So I'm guessing that one of these taps you can actually use to reintroduce the atmosphere. So when you finish sucking, what you actually want to do is you want to let the air back into it because you wouldn't be able to open it with the force of the atmosphere pushing down on the lid. So that's what that's going to be for. So one of them will connect to the vacuum pump and uh, I'm guessing everyone will reintroduce atmosphere back into our vacuum chamber. It does feel a little bit loose at the moment, this vacuum gauge where it connects through the perspex, so I don't know if we'll need to tighten that up, or if maybe when we start to pull a vacuum on it, maybe it will actually uh, seal itself. I'm not actually sure. As I say, I've never really worked with vacuums before, so I am by no means sure. It feels like there's a rather substantial O-ring fixed to the bottom of here. Yeah, I can feel it. It's quite a deep piece of silicon rubber. So that is going to form a seal with the top of our uh, vacuum chamber. Oh, that's a thought. Anyway, let's get the vacuum chamber out and take a look. So here's our vacuum chamber from the feel of it. I think this is made from uh, stainless steel. Yeah, it's, uh, it feels too cold to the touch for aluminium, so it's not aluminium. I think it's made from, pretty sure it's stainless. So we've got a warning here, it says warning, close the vacuum chamber exhaust valve before closing the vacuum pump to cut off the air circuit. I really don't know why it would be a safety issue or why we need a warning to close the valve. So of course this should actually sit on top of here. Now of course this might remind you of a, a pressure cooker. I can remember my gran used to have a pressure cooker which was, it was a lot like this construction but it had a heavy aluminium lid on it. But of course with a pressure cooker you have to have like latches, you have to have uh, like a, a bayonet fixing would you call it around the top of the pressure cooker lid so that you actually have to stop the lid from being blown off. But actually the lid on this, when we suck the air out of here, it's going to be pushed down by the atmosphere across this, uh, well the whole surface, it's going to have the whole atmospheric weight pushing down on it. So in theory that's going to hold the lid on. We don't need anything to hold the lid on because the vacuum is going to be doing that. Let's just hope it will get a good seal. Oh, 
So of course we do actually need to connect this to the vacuum pump and it comes with a comes with a hose, charging hose. This is 2500 psi and uh, I think that's the burst pressure and it's got a normal rating of 500 psi. Now just reading the instructions for our gauge it says that we've got this little stopper on top of it and uh, what it's telling us to do is remove this stopper for 15 minutes with, whilst keeping the gauge in an upright position because I think this is to let air back into it. It's an oil filled gauge. Now these gauges are actually oil filled for a reason in that they're oil filled to actually damp to help stop the uh, to stop the needle here from vibrating because I think if you have things like vacuum pumps and compressors then what they, what they will do is they will vibrate, the needle will vibrate in sympathy with the uh, displacement of the compressor cylinders as they go up and down. It will make the needle vibrate backwards and forwards which makes it hard to read but I think it actually is quite hard on the meter movement. So what the oil does I believe is uh, it actually it's a damper, it's provided to damp everything down so according to the instructions you've actually got to let the the pressure equalize on the inside and the outside and maybe you can get bubbles dissolved into the oil. Now this has been sat in storage for some weeks, it hasn't been shaken around so I would have thought if there was any bubbles within this oil it's come out by now but we're going to follow the instructions we've, we've done what it says I've taken the rubber cap here off the top I'm going to leave it off for 15 minutes and then we'll put it back on. There we go, 15 minutes has elapsed, we'll put the lid back on. So our vacuum chamber setup does come with this instruction book but it really only consists of uh, well a couple of pages of uh, English and nothing in there is, uh, is really particularly useful. Um, there's nothing that you could, couldn't work out for yourself. So the instructions don't appear to mention at all the fact that we've got these two little air filters and I'm guessing that one of the air filters probably goes on top of the vacuum chamber so that when you release the vacuum it doesn't pull dirty air into it but um, yeah I'm not really sure that would be a massive consideration really and uh, it comes with a few washers as well which also doesn't mention it comes with some big washers and uh, some smaller ones so I'm guessing that maybe these bigger washers maybe go at the bottom of the manifold these are maybe the seals which uh, hold this pressure gauge manifold onto the lid of our vacuum chamber it doesn't describe them and there's a uh, well a couple couple of smaller washers which I was going to say do they go into the end of the uh, the vacuum hose mm, not sure maybe they're the seals for these uh, air filters again I don't know it leaves that up to my imagination which I have to admit is really quite vivid so I'm not sure so apart from the instructions for the vacuum chamber we do also get a little love letter which says thank you for your purchase Hope you are satisfied with our goods and services. We would be extremely grateful if you could leave us positive feedback with a five star rating. Um, and it's also got their web address on it which looks like it's bacoeng.com uh, for OEM and customer needs. So you can contact them if there's a problem. I think this company did actually get pretty good feedback when I looked at them online. So uh, I'm not anticipating any problems with our vacuum chamber but we will see. And I've just noticed another letter. Dear sir or madam, if you are seeing this letter it's because our product has travelled thousands of miles crossing mountains and plains to get to you. That sounds quite romantic doesn't it? Thank you for choosing Bakerwang from all the many choices that are available to you. We take this opportunity to offer our products and services to meet all your requirements. Okay well I don't mind that. It's a nice little letter. Let's hope this thing performs well. I still have got no idea what this is. I think maybe it's a heat proof mat or something like that. It really doesn't tell us. So here's the vacuum pump itself and this is a piece of equipment that I've got to admit I've got most interest in. So let's get the box open and see what's in here. Alright, okay, well that's one thing that's good. This does actually come with uh, a much more complete manual for the pump. Looks like there's only a couple of pages in English but um, there's certainly a lot more in it than there was in the uh, manual for the vacuum chamber and there's 
some nice diagrams with some exploded views and uh, various parts lists and things of that nature so uh, nothing wrong with that that looks all well and good so it looks like we've got a bottle of uh, what they call vacuum oil which is probably just like a thin compressor oil it certainly sounds like oil so just lifting the pump out of the box i can tell you it's actually relatively heavy it feels quite substantially made it's uh, got an inbuilt carrying handle on the top which uh, does make handling it and moving it round quite easy so yeah that's quite sturdy i think there's uh, it's not just plastic that there's obviously a piece of metal which runs up through the body of the pump here so it doesn't feel as though that handle will come off at all now looking at the top of it here i believe this is where we can fill it up with oil and I'm assuming that this top cap here is probably where we attach our vacuum hose to although again there's not a huge amount of information in the instructions now it does say though before we actually use the pump we've got to fill it up with oil so uh, I guess the oil goes in there and uh, it did come with a, a bottle of oil so let's fill it up with oil now and uh, hopefully you can see there's a sight glass in here and uh, I'm guessing we've got to fill it up until it's near the top of the sight glass now of course it's going to be interesting to see exactly how much oil I can pour onto the top of the bench here rather than filling up our vacuum pump. The logical thing would be to go and get a funnel but that would involve going downstairs to the garage and I can't be bothered. Well it looks as though they've given us about enough oil to fill this pump to about three quarters full. I guess that's quite good really because if they gave us more oil than that of course the temptation would be to overfill it so maybe by giving us just the right amount that's actually a clever thing to do. And let's screw the cap back on. So on the side of the pump here there is a maker's plate but I think it's actually just glued on so no doubt that will fall off very shortly so we better look what it says now before it does that. So the model of the pump is a BA-1 it says that the free air displacement is 3 CFM. Now I think 3 CFM will stand for 3 cubic feet per minute, probably, something like that. The ultimate vacuum is 0.8 PA, which I think is Pascal's. The voltage is 220 to 240 volts at 50 hertz, so that should suit us here. The power is 1 quarter horsepower. I mean, amazing really, who bothers to give motors in horsepower anymore? And the oil capacity is 250 milliliters. OK, well I've gone ahead and I've plugged it in, so I'm quite interested now just to switch it on and see what happens. I think what might actually happen is it could actually blow the fuses in my plugs here because I think they're actually set at 3 amps, something quite low because I'm normally dealing with valve radios, but let's find out. OK, well the, uh, the fuses didn't blow, shall we actually see how much current it's using? So that's only drawing one amp and the wattage is hundred and forty four watts. Well I'm afraid I've still got absolutely no idea what to do with these air filters so I'm just going to assume that we do indeed want to uh, screw it into there because nothing seems to really tell me what I need to do with them. So let's go ahead and take the, uh, the hose from our vacuum chamber. I'm going to screw this onto the top of the uh, pump and let these two enjoy some sexy time together. So I think that valve is now, that one would be open. We want it closed, so we want to open that valve and we need to try to line up that seal with the top of the pot, which I think I have done. And let's switch on the pump. Okay, and I can see that very rapidly it does actually pull down a vacuum.
I think the needle stopped moving so we, we close that off and in theory that is well that's going to be very powerfully fixed onto there so I can't pull that off and amazingly even though everything's only been screwed fairly loosely I can't actually hear any anything hissing I can't, I can't actually hear any air leaks so in fact just to prove that let's just uh, release this hose from the compressor or the vacuum pump sorry and uh, well let's leave it for 10 minutes and see how long it maintains vacuum well it's about 15 minutes later and actually our vacuum gauge it hasn't moved at all it's maintained a perfect vacuum so it does look like the gauge the manifold and the seal around the top of the pot that seems to be working perfectly actually much better than I was expecting so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave it a little while and see if uh, see how long it takes for the air to leak back into it it was disconcerting to see the sun arc in less than a minute to see a snail race by my flowers flinging wide their petals to embrace the new day. Well we're actually a couple of hours later for the simple reason that I actually forgot about this thing but you can see that we still got a pretty good vacuum in fact I think this uh, this is just where we left it so just to prove that let's just let the air back in now. Just wondering at what point I can pull the lid off it so I'm pulling on the lid now Okay, it's not far off atmospheric, I still can't get the lid off. So there's obviously absolutely no way, oh, there we go. So actually I couldn't pull the lid off that until we were pretty much back to atmosphere. Has it put a dent in the ring there, in the uh, silicon? No, it doesn't seem to have. Now very many years ago you won't be surprised to hear that my favourite subject at school was physics and I remember an experiment in the physics lab which completely captivated me and what they had was a huge glass, uh, would, it, would you call it a bell jar or something like that, a big glass jar and into that glass jar they put um, a bell, an electric bell and then they sucked the air out of this uh, glass jar and the bell went silent. Well I'd actually quite like to see if we could recreate that test. Well unfortunately I don't have a, an electric bell to use, all I've got is this uh, this old cheap and nasty super drug radio. So what I've done is I've actually gone ahead and I've set my signal generator to 90 megahertz and we've got this tuned into the FM band so if I just turn the sound up hopefully you can hear that and you can still hear it if I put it into our vacuum chamber. Now what I plan to do is I'm going to put it into our vacuum chamber I'm going to suck all the air out. It'll be interesting to see if uh, if the radio goes silent. Now the reason it will go silent is because the way that we can hear sound of course is it's sound waves and sound wave travels by the gas molecules banging into each other. So if we suck all the air out from around this radio there will be no gas molecules to transfer the sound energy from the speakers to our ears. So in theory it should go pretty silent although of course we'll also get some sound being transmitted through the body of the radio and maybe just through contact into the body of the vessel so we still may hear it or I'm not even sure if we'll actually pull enough vacuum to remove enough air to hear it go silent. Now the other thing that might be interesting to see is will pulling a vacuum affect this LCD? I think it might do but uh, yeah these are the things that we do in the name of science so let's give it a go. Here's our radio, turn that up fairly loud. Well Unfortunately that's a little bit of a fail because just putting the lid on makes it goes a lot quieter. I can still hear it, hopefully you can. Let's just put a couple of old capacitors in for good measure. Okay, our capacitors do still seem intact.
Well, it looks like the capacitors are okay. They're still intact. I thought that they might have puked their insides out, but no, they seem to be okay. So our radio does appear to have gone totally silent. I can't hear anything now. Let's reintroduce some air and see if the sound comes back. Okay, so that's the level of sound we're at. Let's have another go. Vacuum pump on now. Can still hear it there. Yep, can still hear that. Still sounds quite loud to me. Well, I can still hear a little bit in the background, but it's certainly quieter than it was. Let's release the vacuum. Well, disappointing really. I thought these capacitors might have actually um, bulged or burst open, but they don't seem to have uh, any effect on them. Now, I do have some memory, probably more than 20 years ago at work. I remember that we did use a vacuum pump on a machine that I was building at the time. And uh, that vacuum pump was a different design to this one, totally different pump mechanism. And from memory, that vacuum pump was actually really noisy. It sounded like a Dalek wanking in a biscuit tin. But this pump's actually really quiet, and of course, hopefully you've got no problem hearing me above the noise of this vacuum pump. In a, in a workshop, this really wouldn't be too distracting. It does have a little bit of vibration to it, but it's nothing excessive. Now I've had this continuously pumping now. It's not pulling down a vacuum, it's just pumping. And uh, this has been running for about 10 minutes on and off. And uh, well, certainly at the moment, everything's just completely cold to the touch. Okay, anyone bored yet? Let's try something pointless. Well, you say tomato, I say tomato. Well, that was extremely disappointing, wasn't it?
Anyway, anyway well, let's try leaving it in there for half an hour and uh, then letting the pressure back in. Maybe it will uh, crush. Who can tell? Easy whizzy, let's get busy. Well, I'm afraid to say it just feels like an ordinary tomato. Surely that should have exploded. Bah. Now one of the uses for a vacuum pump like this is for degassing fluids. And uh, if you're wondering what you might want to degas, I'm sure some of you have seen some of those resin paperweights where you have like a, a lump of plastic and it's got some novelty gift, a spider or a flower or, I don't know, some dead insect embedded inside it. Well, if you're anything like me, you've looked at those ornaments and you've been amazed that they don't actually have air bubbles trapped inside them. And the reason that they don't have air bubbles trapped inside them is because they take the resin and they do some what they call degassing. Because anything, you know, if you leave it standing on a shelf, any resin will get air dissolved into it. So what we've actually got here is we haven't actually got any resin. I've actually just got some water. And if it's looking a little bit funky, that's because I've just put, on, put a little bit of washing up liquid in it. Because I'm hoping that this will give us quite a vivid demonstration of this is just plain water and we're going to start to draw a vacuum on it. Now some of you might say well of course we all know that water boils at a low temperature if you put it in a vacuum. Yes you're quite right it does. But before we actually get anywhere near the pressure which would cause the water in here to boil, it will first of all start to degas. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this water in the vacuum chamber, take a look at it with the camera, we'll switch the pump on and hopefully we should see it start to foam but it will actually start to foam well before we actually pull a deep vacuum on here. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to start to switch our pump on now. Okay you can see a little bit of foam has actually appeared on the top of the water so looking at the uh, pressure gauge it looks as though we're about I think that's about 15 inches of mercury. So I think that's something, we're at the altitude now of something akin to maybe the uh, the height of Mount Everest, something like that. Okay, so this water still does look quite cloudy, but I think that's just the uh, detergent that I've got in it. But I can see a couple of bubbles, but I think they were just from when I disturbed it, when I got it out of its container. So, yeah, it does seem to be uh, relatively effective at degassing stuff, but um, I don't know, somehow I expected more. I'm just going to try the same experiment with something thicker, so we're going to use some bubble bath, because that's probably got more the uh, consistency of resin, and I'm trying to slosh it around a bit, maybe try to get some uh, bubbles into there. So I think the idea is, as you pull a vacuum on this, the actual bubbles get larger, they actually swell up and I think that makes them more buoyant and makes them pull to the top of the fluid, they actually float to the top where they then um, burst. So I think that's the mechanism by how the actual degassing is achieved. It actually enlarges the bubbles at first which just makes them float to the top. Okay so we're pulling a vacuum there, let's leave it at that for a little while. Well I can see we've still got a fair amount of bubbles floating on the top of our bubble bath mixture. Let's see if they disappear when we release the vacuum. Well again we don't seem to have got a perfect job, we've been left with uh, some bubbles right at the top of the uh, shampoo mixture here but certainly all the bubbles that we had floating lower down have uh, pulled out and I don't think they would have settled out on their own quite as quickly. This has actually only been under vacuum about 15 or 20 minutes so perhaps if we left it a bit longer the re remaining bubbles from the top would have uh, disappeared but it could actually be that this fluid is just a little bit too thick for that. I'm sure that the proper resin materials probably have some um, chemicals in them to help them degas, maybe to make the uh, the bubbles burst of their own accord, because they don't appear to have burst. 
Well, I think for the final part of today's tomfoolery, I've actually gone ahead and I've put a glass of uh, fairly hot water. It's 48 degrees at the moment, looking at the thermometer that's in there. And we're going to pull a vacuum, and what we should see is this water is actually going to boil at a much lower temperature. Well, certainly that's the plan. So we're about the height of Mount Everest now. We've just gone over that. Oh, and there you can see that our liquid actually started to boil there quite vigorously. Now I'm looking at the temperature and uh, the temperature's dropped by a couple of degrees as we would expect because it takes energies, it changes from a, from a liquid into a, a gas, into steam. So actually the temperature of the, the stuff has actually fallen a little bit. Unfortunately, a bit of a fail because our uh, vacuum chamber is actually steamed up so we can't see anything can we anymore that's a shame okay I've given that a bit of a, a wipe let's have another go and there it goes starts boiling again so taking a final look at the pressure gauge there, I think I actually pulled a slightly deeper vacuum than I intended. So the actual um, water started to boil at about um, 25 inches of mercury, um, whereas it was boiling really furiously at about 27. I think I went slightly over there, but I have to shut it off because the water, the moisture can actually damage the... Uh, the vacuum pump because it can get into the oil and cause damage so I'm afraid that's all we can actually do but I think uh, it does demonstrate the principle doesn't it that water will boil at a lower temperature if you reduce the pressure so uh, yeah it takes me back to my physics experiments in school which is uh, always good fun Well I don't know about you but right from the start of this video where we did the unboxing I've been wondering what this is. So the bottom of our vacuum chamber here it's actually quite a smooth uh, polished surface and uh, it's actually also quite a flat polished surface underneath this glass here but it's actually concave so what can happen is if you put the glass down there'll be some air trapped underneath the glass in the concave section so we'll suck the air out and maybe we'll get some condensation forming around the glass but when we let the air back in again what will happen is the air pressure will act on the top of the glass and it'll push it down and it'll get stuck to the bottom of the container so the mat itself does actually feel like a piece of uh, silicon. I can see that it's got a fiberglass weave inside it. But I actually held this up to my mouth earlier and you can actually blow through it. So although it feels like kind of silicon rubber, it's obviously got lots of pinholes in it. So we'll just put this in here. When we put our glass in now, and we pull a vacuum on it, all the air will get sucked out in just the same way. But this time what will happen is when we reintroduce the air, because this mat has got perforations in, in all round it and under it, that the air will go back into the mat and it will creep back under the glass and it will stop it getting stuck to the bottom of the vacuum chamber. So that's what the purpose of this mat is for. Vegetable rights and peas.